federal agencies cooperate and communicate on biosecurity strategy and implementation because while this is an excellent case study of one state we want to highlight what some of the things are that are transferable to your states if you are not from Hawaii and and then this the one housekeeping thing is with each of the panels they'll be structured the same way for the first period of time each individual panelist will make a presentation then I will have a little moderated questions and answers and then we will go to you for questions from the audience to close out of that particular panel so you all can be thinking if there is something you want to ask while we're going through the presentations in the moderated discussion so you're ready when we move to questions from the audience I'm going to just briefly introduce the panelists in the order in which they are speaking and we'll get right on to it because the first speaker will be Josh Atwood he's the program supervisor of the Hawaiian face of species council he manages that council and as part of his duties as the coordinator for the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Forestry and Wildlife I like that I have a lot of divisions branches and everything as you get to where there's a real person doing work and that's what we have here today he served on the project team that developed this study and and as I learned last night he's originally from Maine which is somehow a logical pathway to Hawaii but he got here the second speaker will be Vernon Harrington he's the state plant health director for the USDA in the animal plant health inspection service and he graduated from the University of Hawaii it gave me delayed post-traumatic stress to read that he managed the California fruit fly and glassy wing sharpshooter programs he also managed the Arizona carnal bunt program and has moved through different positions port director and such in various places to his current position and the third speaker will be Mark Fox he's the director of external affairs for the Nature Conservancy in the Hawaii program he was raised on Hawaii Island practiced law in Honolulu worked on the staff of US Senator Daniel Inouye and then joined the Nature Conservancy in in 2000 which in the past has been a path to higher positions in Hawaii so that is a good thing with that let's move right to the presentations of the panelists and begin with Josh Josh all right thank you very much secretary and aloha and good morning everyone I want to first thank Governor Ige for introducing this initiative and I want to also thank the Western Governors Association for all the work that's gone into all four of the workshops and especially this one it's been a really good series of discussions so I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of this uh, after today's event so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of the biosecurity plan in large part because the Western Governors Association uh, biosecurity and invasive species initiative kind of follows the scope and structure of our uh, Hawaii biosecurity plan in terms of um, its definition of biosecurity and uh, how it works across multiple levels of government. Bear with me while we do the traditional, how does the clicker work? There we go. Um, but first I wanted to just underscore the severity of the problem. Uh, Governor Ige mentioned that we are the invasive species capital of the world and that's backed by data. Um, this figure is from a recent study that looked at um, relative rates of introduction for eight different common taxa of introduced species. So basically when you're looking at the map, the jurisdictions that are in yellow are the ones that are have relatively few introduced species in that given taxa, like amphibians, ants, birds, etc. And the ones that are in red are the places where there are relatively higher rates of introduction within that taxa and Hawaii gets a perfect score of bright red for all eight of these taxa. And the study finds that Hawaii is actually the most invaded uh, place in the world, along with uh, North Island of New Zealand and the Lesser Sunda Islands of Indonesia. 
So then turning to how we deal with this problem in Hawaii, um, I wanted to kind of introduce our, our current structure of how we work together. Uh, there are silos here, like in every state, uh, we have our different agencies that each have a piece of the invasive species problem, and that includes the agency I work for, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, as well as our Department of Agriculture, our Department of Health that works on uh, vectors of human disease that are also invasive species, our Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, our Transportation Agency, and then the University of Hawaii. Um, we do a, a fairly good job in Hawaii, I think, of coordinating across these silos and talking to one another uh, about projects. One of the ways we do that is through the Interagency Hawaii Invasive Species Council, uh, which allows the directors of these agencies to get together on a regular basis and also provide funding that supports interagency projects. Um, we're one of the few states that gets funding from the legislature each year to support projects that fill gaps in between agency mandates. Um, there are always gonna be areas in between different agencies that are not addressed. And we also use those funds to support uh, new research. So some of those interagency partnerships that we work on are actually a great source of uh, multi-level engagement for us. In Hawaii, we have invasive species committees and watershed partnerships on each island. Uh, those are some of those gap-filling entities that I, I mentioned, and they work with local communities as well as county governments, and then they're engaged in state government processes as well. Um, so that really helps us kind of bridge the continuum of stakeholders involved in biosecurity. I also want to mention the group on the right side here, the coordinating group on alien pest species. That's out of the University of Hawaii, and that's a quarterly meeting process where we get folks from um, state government, county government, interested parties, but also the um, representatives from our local federal offices come to these meetings. And it's a great way for us to coordinate across what's happening at different levels and who needs what support to move forward. Um, I don't have it on the slide here, but I also want to mention that we coordinate really well with our partners in the Pacific. Um, while we are the westernmost state, uh, I think we tend to coordinate uh, regionally more with the Pacific region. So we are part of the Regional Invasive Species Council for Micronesia and Hawaii and the Pacific Invasives Partnership. And through those uh, working groups, we try to help implement the Regional Biosecurity Plan for Micronesia and Hawaii and other regional initiatives across the Pacific. So that's our current setup, uh, but the way we approached the biosecurity plan was to start with a gaps analysis. And while um, we do a pretty good job of working with each other, we know that there are certain types of gaps. Um, so I'm not gonna read through all of these, but um, there are different types of gaps addressed by the plan. And uh, the gaps analysis also allowed us to recognize some of our shortfalls. In particular, the pie chart here shows that out of a roughly $13 billion state budget, 0.4% um, of that is going to our Department of Agriculture, which is our primary biosecurity agency for the state, and then 1% is going to the Department of Land and Natural Resources, which also has a big biosecurity role. And that's their total agency budget, so I should say that um, that includes things like ag uh, product marketing or uh, Bureau of Conveyances. So the amount of that funding that's actually going to invasive species work is a subset of that. The other thing we recognized when uh, putting together the biosecurity plan is that our position counts are actually lower today than they were 10 years ago in some cases um, for our Department of Ag inspectors and for our uh, Department of Health uh, vector control branch that works on issues like mosquitoes. And that's due in large part to the economic downturn. So the resulting plan uh, is a 10-year shared path forward. This is the 2017 to 2027 interagency biosecurity plan. Um, we say that it's comprehensive in scope, and what we mean by that is that uh, the way we use the term biosecurity and the way it's being used in the WGA initiative is not just the traditional view of border biosecurity. It includes pre-border biosecurity that describes um, regulations and compliance on commodities that have not yet been shipped to Hawaii. It, of course, includes border biosecurity uh, for interception and response at the border, 
And it also includes post-border biosecurity, which is the traditional EDRR, uh, rapid response, as well as control of established species, um, sometimes indefinitely. Um, and that includes biological control. So the plan is a look at the different resources we need. There are uh, about 150 action items that each address a specific gap or weakness, and they're all laid out on a 10-year time frame. These are just some of the highlights. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but um, some of the main areas that we want to improve in by 2027 are better risk assessments and electronic manifesting at our Department of Agriculture. Um, that's actually a really fascinating concept that I'm not going to go into because it's uh, on the agenda for later today. Same for regulation of ballast and biofouling um, in Hawaii. Uh, we need inspection facilities so that our Department of Ag inspectors are not uh, inspecting commodities on the tarmac uh, in the open air. And uh, we have targets for personnel that we're hoping to meet by 2027. I think this will be probably our greatest challenge. Um, we are hoping to double the inspection staff at our State Department of Agriculture, uh, in large part because, as I mentioned, we have fewer staff that now than we did 10 years ago, but the number of visitors and the amount of cargo coming to the state gets higher every year. Um, we need to increase field capacity at some of our other agencies, provide stability to our partnerships, and um, provide a new biological control research facility for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, which is a process we've already started, but I'm really interested in what the governor mentioned this morning about the pursuit of a potential uh, Pacific regional facility that could um, bring in federal partners as well and serve as a, a collaborative research institution for the region. So we're very committed to making sure this plan doesn't just sit on the shelf. Um, we are 15% into that 10-year timeline, and currently we have 24% of the actions in the plan that have been either completed or are ongoing in perpetuity. Uh, we have another 22% that have been initiated and will hopefully be completed in the next eight and a half years, uh, and then the rest of the items are all uh, on the timeline ahead of us. And this is another slide with a lot of text that I'm not going to go through um, each line, but this is kind of where we are currently. Uh, if you want to read the full details on this, we do have uh, implementation progress report on the Invasive Species Council website where you can read about what has and has not happened with implementing our biosecurity plan. But we do have some early successes in terms of investing in personnel, uh, restoring items that were lost in the economic downturn, and then investing in new technologies. What we need next is what I mentioned earlier about um, substantial increases in personnel, and that being our big challenge. Um, it's always hard to get new positions created, but what we find uh, the more we talk about this is that biosecurity is really uh, a people issue. It's having the capacity and then working together on things. So hopefully we can address that soon. And that's it for me. I'll be happy to take questions uh, during the Q&A later on. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Vernon? All right, well, first of all, thanks for uh, inviting us here. And um, I'm filling in for Osama um, Alissi, um, our deputy administrator. He won't be able to make it till later on today, and I think he's meeting with the group. Um, and if you could just pull the mic a little Excuse closer. Me. Okay. Thank you. Let's see the cords there. Let me move up. Anyway, I'll be picking, up the, picking him up this evening, and he'll be participating. Uh, this slide here is basically our overall structure. PPQ's um, mission is to protect American agriculture and facilitate safe trade. We have uh, three core functional areas, the field, field operations, which is where we have a state plant health director in every state, and we partner with, with the universities and the, with the Department of Agriculture to implement our work, and we work with Customs and Border Protections and the different agencies. Then we have a policy management um, up in headquarters, they're basically overlooking our, all of our operations, um, working on offshore initiatives and different activities that we do. And then we have a science department, science and technology. They support what we do uh, as far as our operations or pest mitigation protocols. 
And basically what we do is, uh, or from up in DC, we have cross-functional working groups so that we're always in communication, always analyzing the work that we're doing and figuring out how we can improve and, and move forward. I just wanted to read uh, some notes that Osama wanted me to give about the overall structure about PPQ. And basically, our mission, Sorry, can you read it? Oh, excuse me, plant protection and quarantine. Yeah, USDA APHIS plant protection and quarantine, excuse me. So basically, to accomplish the safeguarding part of our mission, we focus our work in two key areas, preventing pests from entering and becoming established and fighting back against those pests that get in. The work spans a wide spectrum of activities from offshore programs, permitting, port and border inspection, pest identification, mitigation, smuggling, interdiction and trade compliance, pest detection response, pest management and eradication programs. And most people know the AQI program by its port of entry activities, including inspections of commercial vessels, trucks, aircraft, rail cars, cargo, and international passenger baggage, which are carried out primarily by our partners at US Customs Border Protection. Few, re few, few realize the significance role APHIS plays in this program from risk assessment and analysis to the development of policies, protocols, and standards for inspections, identifications and diagnostics, to treatment and mitigation protocols. Basically, we partner, we work in there, we partner with CBP to um, safeguard against the entry and establishments of pests. So that's kind of our, I, I'll be giving a talk later as, as far as the pre-border de uh, pre detection on my part of the, I think at 145, and we have another panel, but I, I believe these will be available through the notes. And what I wanted to do also is just kind of skim through some of the programs that we have, some of the national programs that uh, were going on here. Uh, eradicating um, cotton pests, that's been a big thing. And in fact, the pink bollworm, um, that's just been er declared eradicated in October, I believe. Combating fruit flies, we're always working on different programs. Like um, I guess when we mentioned earlier, uh, when I first started, with PPQ or, or soon after than I worked with in California, we had we were dealing with eradication programs because we had so many introductions that we were going from county to county and location to location. So what it find what we finally ended up doing was implementing the sterile insect release where the entire basin we were in, in releasing sterile insects to control fruit flies. So which reduced the need for pesticides and you know and facilitated helped to facilitate trade. And Another interesting thing about the fruit flies, um, fruit fly work actually, with all the expertise that we have with P. Bark, Pacific Basin Agriculture Research Center, C uh, Center for Plant Health Science and Technology, the University of Hawaii, for the last 20 or at least 30 years or more, most of the fruit fly or most and a lot of the fruit fly tools to eradicate, trap, and lure has actually been developed here in Hawaii to utilize around the world to control and eradicate fruit flies. So. Just wanted to point that out. Again, trying to deal with the citrus, citrus greening and dealing with different, different things that's going on there, some of the national programs. Um, reducing tree pest, th um, tree pest threats, uh, wood boring insects. Uh, one of the things down there is working to improve global implementation of ISPM 15. That's basically requiring our trading partners to trade to make sure they treat pallets so they're not containing any pests when they come in from wood bearing uh, wood boring pests and i guess that's kind of an overall of ppq um a fast area and i'll um, open it up to questions later i'll answer the questions later great thank you very much uh mark <laughs> Well, we're going to go without it unless it decides to pop up, and maybe Josh can keep pressing that. Um, there we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, this is, a, this is a nod to a really close friend that many of you know who retired from the Nature Conservancy just earlier this year, and that's Pat Biley. 
And Pat is uh, still on Maui fighting the good fight, but uh, this was when I first started and I did my first invasive species talk uh, as an employee of the Nature Conservancy. This was a slide that Pat gave me probably back in 2000, so I thought I'd share it for the uh, exact reaction we got um, from, from you all. So thanks, it's, I'm Mark Fox. I'm the Director of External Affairs from the Nature Conservancy. And um, uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit about one of the things that I'm hopeful comes out of this really important workshop, but more importantly, the Western Governors Associations and, and Governor Ige's uh, biosecurity initiative. Um, and I almost threw out my notes because over a beer last night, um, Vernon and I solved it. Um, and so, uh, not, no, he did. He, he gave me some good advice and I think it's gonna be taken care of, but, um, but that's still, I think I'm gonna go through with a little story for you. And, and uh, I, think, I think it'll ring true for some of the folks that are here from, from other Western states as well. Josh talked about how here in Hawaii, we are known for our successful partnerships. He talked about the watershed partnerships, the invasive species committees, the coordinating group on alien pest species, the um, uh, Hawaii Invasive Species Council. And we do really, really well working here in Hawaii together across federal agencies, state agencies, local agencies, nonprofits, partnerships um, to address our common issues. And uh, we're known for that. And, and we have folks from outside Hawaii go, oh, you're so advanced. Um, and yet we still think we have a lot more to do. Uh, even with all those partnerships and the risk assessments and the planning that we've done, an area where we struggled, and this is where Vernon solved it for me last night, so we've struggled is sort of at the regional and national level, and that is um, working with federal agencies beyond Hawaii to get uh, stronger protections um, for the state and for the region in the forms of, of uh, federal rules from APHIS, for example. And I know Dorothy sitting there nodding and she bangs her head against the wall, as we all do, to try to figure out how to take care of this. Um, and it's, it's been especially frustrating. Uh, um, Vernon mentioned fruit flies. Hawaii sits under a quarantine for fruit flies and some other pests that aren't native to here. They were introduced to Hawaii. But when you all, we all fly to the mainland, either you going home or we go on a trip, we go through ag quarantine inspection, and that's to protect mainland agriculture from the pests that we have that were introduced here. Um, we get it. Um, we don't wanna you know, cause more fruit fly problem than there already is on the mainland, but it's been difficult to kind of get reciprocal kinds of treatment um, for things coming into Hawaii. And, and um, uh, so you know, finding that path forward is, has been a frustration. It got so frustrating um, Back in about 2006 to 2008, Senator Inouye, who I had the pleasure of working for in the 90s, um, and then Congressman Ed Case, who were stoked to have going back to Washington, D.C., they got so frustrated that they actually introduced bills. Senator Inouye went so far as to put a, a version of his bill into the farm bill at that time, a uh, draft of the farm bill, and what the bill would have set done would have allowed the state of Hawaii to submit the governor a application to APHIS for um, rules um, for some imminent pest threat that, that may be uh, coming to Hawaii or identified coming to Hawaii. And if the Secretary of Agriculture didn't act on those, um, that application and those proposed rules within 60 days, they'd go into automatic effect. Um, as you can imagine, that caused a bit of consternation um, at APHIS. Uh, uh, plant protection and quarantine, that would be pretty unprecedented for a state to pass federal rules to protect itself in 60 days. But Senator Noy felt so strong about this, he stuffed it into the Senate version of the Farm Bill, the giant uh, comprehensive agriculture bill that's passed by the Congress every four years. It ultimately, after promises to work together and work on pathway risk assessments between the state and the, and the federal government, um, it got withdrawn from the bill. Um, but even so, we did all that work and still we're still struggling to figure out what's that breakthrough area. And I'll jump ahead a little bit. Um, you know, we're all keenly aware of what we're dealing with now with Rapidohia death fungus. Especially on this island, two varieties, and now sadly on Kauai, one variety. Um, and as you know, Ohia is the uh, one of the two dominant native tree species in our forest, critical to the ecological 
ecological function of native forest in Hawaii, essential to its watershed function and the foundation of Hawaiian culture. Um, so we're wrestling with that. Ohia is under great threat right now. Uh, back in 2012, where's Rob Hoff? Um, Rob Hoff and our late friend Lloyd Loop worked really hard on a draft application to APHIS under APHIS's not approved for import pending pest risk assessment or NAPA rules. And they sent that draft up to APHIS headquarters in Riverdale, right? Um, and it kind of bounced around up there for a couple of years. There was one person who took it under their wing a bit, thought, well, maybe not a NAPRA petition, but a secretary's order, but we're not sure what a secretary's order is. Uh, meantime, back here in Hawaii, there was an emergency state rule. It expired. Things kind of bounced around. Again, we're not quite finding the right pathway forward for stronger, stronger protections. Jump forward to today, um, State Department of Agriculture, I'm ex so excited to say, is um, poised to have public hearings on permanent state rules to prohibit uh, myrtle import species um, for, and I apologize, that the uh, uh, NAPRA application that was sent forward was to pre prevent imports of uh, eucalyptus or myrtle species to Hawaii so we don't get another strain of ohia rust in Hawaii. There's one strain here already. It's thankfully not particularly virulent as far as Ohia is concerned. It's killed off uh, non-native rose apple, but we know that there are other strains of this Ohia rust out there. And the last thing Hawaii needs is sort of that number two punch in the one-two punch that, that could really do damage to Ohia while it's already fighting uh, rapid Ohia death. So state of Hawaii poised to go to uh, public hearings. Thank you, Governor Ige, for approving those public hearings on permanent rules here in Hawaii that would prohibit eucalyptus imports and, and the potential threat of a, another strain of um, Ohia rust or eucalyptus rust coming to Hawaii. But again, what we need is parallel federal rules so that we have both state rules and federal rules saying that eucalyptus or myrtle imports to Hawaii are restricted so that we're protected from getting yet an additional strain of rust here in Hawaii. I'm going to end there. I suspect um, other western states can, you know, have sort of similar stories about how do we work together, you know, not just at the local level but the regional and national level, and I'm really hopeful uh, that, that the coming together of this workshop, the coming together of this initiative, the coming together of the Western Governors Association is so that we can sort of share these challenges, figure out what the pathway forward is. Ours is resolved over beer last night, um, so not to worry. Um, you're, uh, you're really making us want to have you announce what you resolved, uh, yeah, exactly. uh, other than completing the beer. Yeah, <laughs> at Burden, and, and that's what's what's the beauty of, of the relationship that we've all developed over the years. Um, Vernon gave me some good advice about how we together should, um, as these Hawaii rules are going through their process and passing, how we should bring this to the attention of his leadership and what a good pathway is for doing that. So we didn't quite solve it, but we have a, a path forward, so thank you. Thank you, Mark, very yeah. much. Let's Now, moving to some questions for the panelists, Mark just teed up the first one very well because everybody mentioned, Josh did a really good job of laying out what, what their plan does, and he talked about coordinating uh, with federal agencies, and uh, Vernon did the same thing coming the other way, but to people that are from other states that are on the ground, what does that actually mean? When you finally have a threat, other, uh, you talk to each other, but how does that go to the ground in activities that you take either in coordination or together? And if you have an example, maybe that would be a good one. Well, I'll, I'll give an example for the coconut rhinoceros beetle. You know, when it was detected, when it was de detected here with, with PBQ, um, we detected it, then we worked immediately with the state. Whenever there's a threat to Hawaii or any state, but especially here in Hawaii, when there, whenever there's a threat, um, you know, with a beautiful, I mean, the great thing about Hawaii is there's real, really no lines, no borders, you know, between all the different agencies. We, we all have our mission, we all have our, you know, our parameters and everything else, but we always look at how do we protect Hawaii and how can we get together, you know, and especially talking about working with Senator Inouye, when we, whenever we come to the table, it's never about, you know, what we can't do, it's like, how can we do it? 
you know, so, so it's always been, and, and that's passed on. But anyway, the coconut raspito, when it came in, you know, state and federal with us being short, uh, at once we identified it and looked at the problem, short staffed, that is. So what we did was we called, we made some calls and brought in our incident management, uh, incident command teams. So they came in and worked with the state and set up a program like they do at forest fires or anything else. We have staff trained within our agency. So they came down and set it up uh, working with the state and then the state came over and, and took over it. We have uh, farm bill money that we, you know, tried to, we put in to try and fund the money. And then because coconut rhinoceros beetle, there is no, right now, there is no magic tool, there is no lure that you're gonna trap them all, there's no treatment that you can eradicate it, you know, for both Hawaii and Guam. So in the meantime, we control it, we, you know, we, we just contain it to where it's at, um, regulate it the best we can. And then the answer is actually something that we hope that will be developed, you know, working with our partners, the University of Hawaii, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, our partners in Guam and CNMI. So that's an example of how we came together. The program is still going, but again, you know, we regulated, we partner, we work together, but the answer will be something that's gonna be developed. I'm gonna ask Josh to comment, but let me just drill down on one thing you said, because okay. you said you established an incident management team. Does that incident management team include both federal and state? So in the specific activities, you're at one place in one command structure coordinating them? Yeah, yes, it is. So they came down to Hawaii and we do. And whenever you come into a, a, um, a program, you know, federal, we look at international, we look at foreign um, produce or co commerce coming in. The states deals with domestic, so you have different regulations and different authorities. So we always partner, it's a shared command team. So it's a, it was the state and federal incident command leaders. Josh, what would you like to add to that? Uh, I just wanted to give a, another example of where I think we've done really well with on the ground partnership with uh, state and federal partners in Hawaii, and that's the response to rapid ohia death on Hawaii Island. So for that effort, uh, it's this really good mixture of scientists from USDA's Agricultural Research Center and from the Forest Service uh, Institute for Pacific Island Forestry, as well as uh, researchers from University of Hawaii and then response teams from the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the university. So it's all these different entities working at multiple levels. And um, I actually forget sometimes who is working for what agency because um, they're focused on the issue um, and you know they're working on their piece of the problem but it's really a more cohesive whole than it is you know I'm gonna do this and run with it um, so I think that's a really good example you know Mark's description of working with federal policy I think is a good um, illustration of how it can be really difficult to work um, at a broader level across that uh, boundary of state and federal, but when it comes to working with the, our local federal offices, I think we have really good relationships there and it results in some good on the ground work. And drawing this to an experience, uh, I have in asking a follow up question. I mean, we have just as was described incident commands for fire in California and then we had a major dam over top and 188,000 people evacuated on no notice. And we chose to do an incident command team uh, exactly fires for the first time. And the real issue was is the people in water just always thought it was their thing, but they didn't necessarily handle the communications or coordination and it really worked. Is that uh, what happens with your incident management team? Do you take people that traditionally sort of work in their silos and it brings other resources to bear so that they actually appreciate having the incident management approach? Yeah, I, I think that's the case. Um, and yeah, when you start one of these responses, you get out your ICS chart and you're filling in the different boxes with folks from different agencies. And so, yeah, someone might be working outside of their traditional role, but I think it helps them appreciate the, the broader network of partners um, working towards the common mission. Mark, you look like you had something to add. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to just, you know, reiterate what, what Vernon and Josh mentioned is how well we work together here. Uh, but as Josh pointed out, where we've been stymied is that, that policy at the national level. Um, um, and so that's, that's just an area for improvement. Figure out, you know, how do we get that policy shift at the national level when there exists 
processes like not approved for importation pending pest risk assessment, yet we can't figure out whether we should do that or a secretary's order. We also know that the Plant Protection Act, the Federal Plant Protection Act, which preempts states from acting to um, address invasive species in certain situations, has exemption provisions in it where a state with a substantive threat or an imminent threat can apply for an exemption from those preemption pr provisions and do something. But it's very unclear what that, that process for applying for that exemption is. Um, so I've just sort of listed three different potential pathways for addressing that policy hangup for us, NAPRA, Secretary's Order, and exemption under the Plant Protection Act, but we haven't quite figured out, you know, what's the route. So again, as I mentioned, very excited about the initiative going forward to see if that, that's an area where we can focus our attention with the Western Governors Association coming out of these workshops and webinars and things. How might we address that together? Well, let me just clarify, because it's interesting. Um, the statements were the cooperation was excellent, but what you're saying is, is that some of the partners in the cooperation don't have the full tools that others do, and that that would be the thing that it could address one of the gaps. I'm not sure that it, we don't have the tools that others do. We'd like to know what those tools are and if anybody's got them. We work great together here and we have the tools to work together here in Hawaii. It's when we want to affect policy beyond Hawaii where we don't know what the tools or pathways are or, or systems are to address that. And Josh, you, as part of your presentation, talked about gaps. Uh, when you do an incident command and you're coordinating, how do you see what the gaps are in the response and how do you identify them and speak to them so people might be able to address them? Uh, well, I should um, put the, my statements in the context of I personally have not run uh, an ICS response, so um, this might be something that maybe Vernon or others can speak to, but um, Utilizing that structure, I think, really helps you avoid the gaps that you would usually have on a day-to-day -day basis um, where you might not have, um, prior to an ICS, an entity that is responsible uh, for outreach on a particular issue. Once you enter into the command structure, you have somebody identified that's going to take that on as their primary role. Um, so I am struggling, I don't think I can think of an, a situation where we have used the formal ICS system and then there's still a remaining gap in terms of um, functions for the response. Um, I know that we still have struggled a little bit with um, changing policy, uh, not just at the federal level, but even at the state and county level in these responses, trying to figure out you know, do we need to pursue a declaration of emergency related to the ICS, or is it something that's more informal? Uh, once we have the ICS set up, we still sometimes have challenges getting access to uh, county or even state properties where we need to operate on the response. So um, there is still a need for a lot of one-on-one -on -one work. and. Um, you know, just to belabor the point of this being a human problem that's based on relationships, I think the, the areas where we do make progress on things like access issues for a response, it's usually because somebody knows somebody. Um, and the areas where we really get stuck is when we don't have uh, that relationship pre-existing. Do either of you have anything you'd like to uh, for the, add to For that? the ICS? Hmm. Yeah, I guess the, the ICS, um, you know, Prior to having incident command um, years ago, we had a few people throughout the agency that if there was an emergency, say fruit fly, or example, carnal bunt, classy wing sharpshooter, it, you'd have an outbreak, then it affected trade, it affected domestic and, and foreign trade. So a team would have to go in there and then set up a program, work with the state or county, set up a quarantine, develop a treatment protocol, and then open, open up trade. But what happened is as our agency grew and people started to retire, we, you know, we wanted to make sure it was consistent. So we have uh, team members throughout the, throughout the country. I think we have three teams, three or four incident command teams. And they're basically trained in all the different areas so they can come into any program and follow this protocol. But as far as any gaps, uh, part of the whole process is in meeting with the affected industry, the stakeholders, and evaluating on an on a ongoing basis. So we do look for those gaps, anything that we're not missing, how we can go ahead and you know, be more effective with the program. 
And one of the things that, that Josh just brought up <coughs> and you reiterated is the whole value of relationships. Uh, how does that work? It, it, just relationships developed over time, random conversations over beers. Uh, uh, <laughs> what is it that, that sort of makes those meaningful and sort of helps break through things? Like, I guess for me, you know, I, I left Hawaii a number of years ago and I got the opportunity to work on a number of programs and working with California. You know, when you work with different states, it's a lot different. Like, for example, if you work in California, there's a lot of industry behind you. So setting up quarantines and doing things differently and challenging regulations, you know, you have Sunkiss, you have Calavo, you have different people behind you. Here in Hawaii, we don't have major agriculture industry. So working with our congressional leadership, um, our partners, you know, with the different agencies, and everybody having a voice at the table, and that's the really only way that we can be effective and, and work things out. So I think, you know, it just, I, that just seems how it works. I, somebody put it, one of the, um, you know, the GMO or the different pioneers or the different groups, they said it's a island mentality. Even though you're competitors or your partners, if you don't share equipment or work together, one of them will go out of business. So even though they're competitors, they're stuck here on the island working together and they, and they do things to be more effective and, you know, and, and run operations. But I just found Hawaii is very unique that way in the partnerships that we have with the different groups. Mark, you want to add to that? Um, no, <coughs> but, well, a little bit. You know, Vernon really hit on it. We are out here on our own and, and uh, relationships are everything. Get just a little closer. Are everything. So I look over and I see Warren Watanabe and, and Main Nakahata over there. And these are folks that I've had the pleasure to know and work with um, for now 25 years. And, and I still call on that, that relationship with them um, on invasive species or other things. Um, and, you know, this is no, way, no different necessarily than anywhere else in the world. But because we are out here on our own, we have to you know, do sort of unique things like Vernon says, um, you know, share equipment when we need to share equipment. I mean, that may be kind of a metaphor for, for a lot of different ways that we interact, but when, when you know, things get tough, we, we're really good about coming together and disregarding um, boundaries or silos. And Josh, you were the first one to actually mention relationships. Do you have anything to add to this? Um, just that I don't think there's any magic solution there. I think it's just time um, having move to Hawaii from out of state, you know, it really does take a, a lot of time and effort and just being with people during a response or, you know, a shared project to build those connections. And while I think it benefits Hawaii that um, we are kind of on our own out here and there's a real sense of community, the other challenge we have is that our counties are broken up by separate islands. And so, you know, it's, um, it can be a hard process sometime to find the resources to actually travel around the state and get to work with different partners. Um, you know, I'm based on Oahu, and so I, I get to know my Oahu partners a lot better than the folks that are over on Big Island. And so, <coughs> excuse me, that's actually a really common problem here that people call Oahu centrism, where uh, we tend to, at the political level, focus more on um, problems and relationships in Oahu. So. Uh, while we benefit from our sense of community, it also takes some special effort, I think, to um, work at a statewide level and build some of those connections. Uh, let me change up a little. And uh, uh, one of the issues that sort of came up in the presentation was the risk of new invasives being introduced. Uh, how do you all assess the risk of new invasives? Are they all equal? Are there some that you really work to do prevention activities over and above anything else. How does that work? Josh, you want to start? Sure. Um, so I'm really glad to say that for Hawaii, I think we have some good tools to do risk assessments for plants uh, for um, nearly, well, I guess, 15 to 20 years. We've had the Hawaii Pacific Weed Risk Assessment. Um, that's built on, you know, models used elsewhere in the world that looks at the characteristics of uh, plant species and whether or not it's likely to be problematic here in Hawaii. So we can say for new introductions of plant material, uh, we can do an assessment before it arrives or shortly after it arrives and make some um, predictive estimates about 
how uh, invasive that plant will be. Um, we don't really have the same type of risk assessment for animal species, but I think that's one of the things that will come out of the Department of Agriculture's work with electronic manifesting and increasing their database capacity is building this set of data that shows you know, which um, insects and other types of pest species are coming in on which commodities and which ones are uh, really problematic. So I think we're starting to move into the direction of having better risk assessments across all taxa. Uh, Vernon, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I guess I'll just add for, uh, for plant protection and quarantine, we have a NPEG, a new pest advisory group. So whenever, th whenever there's a new pest detected, um, you know, they evaluate the risks, um, what's the potential host, uh, what, what treatments they are, and then what actions to take, and then we work with, the, with our state counterparts, but we do utilize a, a group within our, within our overall agency, and that's usually a cross-functional working group, so you have policy as, and management, you know, dealing with the trade issues, and then with science and, and technology, with the science looking at the pests, the background, and research. And it, when you say identify new pests, is that one that's already arrived here? Or is that one that has the potential of arriving here that strikes terror in your heart? Both. I mean, you know, both. I mean, well, the ones that hasn't got here because we don't know, you know, and that's something that we're always doing, looking for, working with international services, our counterparts in international services, what could be possibly coming. Something we do here in Hawaii is, um, in fact, recently I just went to Guam and went, went, met with our international um, IS um, partners there, you know, uh, somebody who's, uh, I guess they work with, work out of Philippines. But basically looking at what the potential problem is, how we can work and train the Pacific area, how they can strengthen and identify potential pathways coming to Hawaii from there. Now, I mean, for example, so we're always uh, uh, at what about the issue of snakes? Is, is that something that you uh, just have historically worked on prevention or is you found some here that actually made it off of a plane or? That's what, um, wild, uh, with APHIS, but with Wildlife Services, but that's out of Guam, but yeah, that's something that they, you know, especially coming out of Guam, uh, that they're looking at, always detecting, and then doing, I guess the state, actually, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture does the surveys here for the, um, for any snakes around the military bases, especially the brown tree snake. Yeah, we do find snakes here from time to time. I believe the number is eight brown tree snakes have been detected in Hawaii um, over the years, and so they do an amazing job on Guam of doing uh, pre-departure interdiction and making sure more snakes don't come here. But some do sneak through, and so there have been um, you know, a few dead snakes found in wheel wells of airplanes when they arrive, and then every now and then we'll find a uh, released pet snake in the forest. So. Yeah. It is both a um, prevention issue and sometimes a, a rapid response issue. Uh, did you have something to if add, uh, Mark? Sure. Thanks, John. I, I think one of the other areas that um, we, we struggle with is capacity, and capacity to do, to do the work um, with respect to risk assessment. So, you know, we have tools out there like the Hawaii Pest Weed Risk Assessment. There's plenty of databases out there. Um, Dorothy has helped. Uh, Dorothy Alantaga, who works with Vernon, has helped us um, think through opportunities whereby if we had the capacity and the staff time to go through and make the case um, that certain things we're aware of may be um, uh, potential pathways for bringing in pests and diseases to Hawaii, um, that, you know, we should go ahead and, you know, pitch those to um, USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service as things we wouldn't want coming into Hawaii, and if they're not already in the United States or not already otherwise regulated, regulated they may be a relatively easy slam dunk to, to get some restriction on, um, but again, what we struggle a bit with, um, another thing, is just having the, the staffing capacity and the science capacity on hand in our agencies to go ahead and do that work. Um, if we did, uh, or if we could set it aside, that might also help us address the other issue that I was raising, which was not knowing, I guess, John, how the, we may have an idea of what the tools are, but we don't know how they work uh, to change policy. But if we had uh, sort of went through that process a few times before it's an emergency, that may help us sort of uh, get a handle on, on how to use those tools better. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to go to audience questions, so be ready. Um, 
uh, for that. And, and my questions to Josh, um, this has really highlighted the Hawaii interagency biosecurity plan that, that you t uh, talked about and presented. How has that plan, once it was adopted, affected day-to-day -day operations of departments? Did you find some people were doing things that they had never done before? Did you find that some things were really effective? Did you find that there was some resistance someplace in doing things new? How did that translate? What were the issues into what goes on on the ground? Um, one of the things that I usually talk about when I do a presentation on the biosecurity plan is that some of those early wins that I showed on the screen um, are not really wins of the biosecurity plan at all. Um, so, you know, we found that a lot of good work is already happening uh, in Hawaii. And so, for example, the restoration of our Department of Health Vector Control Branch is not because we put that in the biosecurity plan, but because, um, you know, there was an outbreak of dengue uh, on Big Island, and so that really spurred action on it. So um, I don't want to take credit for the good progress that's being made at different state agencies and say that um, it's happening because of the biosecurity plan, but I think that there are um, certain collaborations and efforts that are happening now that have certainly been supported by that and uh, are coming to fruition uh, maybe because we had that planning process and that look forward. Um, you know, for example, I, I think that um, there are some items at our state legislature that have been uh, better supported because there's this interagency planning process behind them. For example, the funding that was provided for the state biocontrol facility planning process, uh, as well as some um, provisions of uh, additional funding for interagency projects and uh, for new personnel. And then I think some of the collaborative efforts amongst partners that are not legislative, um, it's provided some direction for us. Uh, the Invasive Species Council, for example, has um, different topical working groups based on control or research and technology. And we take the actions from the biosecurity plan and say, this is our work plan as a working group for the next few years. So there are th certain things from the plan that um, it comes directly from uh, that document and then it becomes kind of our marching orders. Either of you have anything to add to that? No. Then we're gonna move to your questions. We have mics here. Who has a question of the panel? Yes, right back here. Naturally, it's right in the middle. Just remind you to identify yourself and your affiliation before asking the question. Right, so my name is Matthew Bauer. I'm at the Western Integrated Pest Management Center. And the question I have is, we talk about invasive species broadly, but we all know that some invasive species rise to the level of really important, like rapid ohio death, which is a large federal response, lots of resources being thrown at it. There are other problems which are probably more state-specific, which have less in the way of federal dollars thrown at them. And then we have some very local efforts which never rise to the level of anybody's priority list. You know, we have the Western Governors Association priority list of invasives, but that certainly isn't an exhaustive list of all the invasives that are threatening the West. So when we talk about responses at local, regional, and national levels, uh, levels you know, we, we can't just broadly talk about all the invasive species because some of those are only really important at the local level. A perfect example of that is European grapevine moth. It was only really a problem in the Northern California growing region where you grow wine grapes. And so the local response there was very different than the national level response that you might have against something like um, the, the slide that was shown earlier, which was the um, Asian longhorn beetle, which is a much more federal response. So, so I'm curious to hear um, to what extent this different prioritization or different levels of prioritization of these different species play out in the response, like for instance in the invasive species response plan. You know, are those different levels identified? And it certainly identifies something that Mark was talking about, which was, well, in some cases, there doesn't appear to be a pathway on the federal level. Well, but that species may not wind up on somebody's priority list, in which case it may not be, you know, the pathway may be different. Thank you. Who'd like to take a shot at that question? Sure. Um, you know, I don't know Mark. the answer, but, 
but you're you're more articulately stating the problem that uh, you know that I was putting forward. Um, you know, we may have um, you know something that is of particular concern to us locally or in the state or in the Pacific, but it's not on somebody's list um, at the national level. So what is you know what's that route we need to take? What tools do we need to learn how to use to at least get it on that list in a way that that you know we can protect ourselves a little bit, even if it doesn't require um, you know a large um, national response and an incident command team that includes you know all those agencies. So um, you know, thanks for letting me make my point again. <laughs> or attempt to. Anything to add there? Y you know, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, uh, of the moderator to add one comment of experience, and that is is that when I was in the state legislature we had an incident of light brown apple moth in my legislative district and there was aerial spraying of urban areas and I can't even begin to describe. It got so bad in one of my district offices that, that we actually had to change the outgoing message. Like, if you want Melissa, press one. If you want Bonnie, press two. If you're calling about the light brown apple moth, press three. Because my district people were on the phone 100% of the time on just that. And it led to a bill that I did of a programmatic environmental impact report on anything that might be sprayed in the state in the future so you could do the environmental work, highlight it, highlight what was in it, educate the people before you were actually experiencing the acts of actions in response to the invasive. And it that was even very controversial because there are various interest groups that want no spraying of any kind, and they didn't like the fact that there might have been environmental work implying that spraying was going to be allowed. But that has been a statewide EIR that is really on the verge of being closed down to address exactly that because of the situations that are faced. Other questions that people have? Who, who else has a question here of our panel? Good morning. Um, my name's Mike Harrington, and I want to congratulate you folks on the Endangered uh, Species and Biosecurity Plan. The question I have for you, have you thought about intentional introductions? And another way to, another way to put that is, have you thought about bioterrorism, where a zoonotic disease, for example, could be introduced, um, or a, a plant disease could be introduced? Or what was done 40 years ago on the medfly, introduce sterile medflies into the population to stop the breeding. Is that part of what you're asking well, that, as well? Well, that's true. But okay, let's say you have an intentional uh, introduction of anthrax okay. into like cattle to here or, or another zoonotic disease, for example. Who would like to take a shot at this? Um, I'm, I'm working out here. It's been a while since I've been in the headquarters, but I know when I do spend time in D.C. or when I did, I mean, that's a big part of it, the bioterrorism, the, the threat of that, and I know that's a constant meeting and evaluating, you know, the threat and the, and the risks, I mean, to, to the country or, or anything that could come in. Whenever we do programs, like you say, like the MedFly or you know, um, competitors or anything else, that's something we're always surveying for and looking. If we do find anything, then that's why we do the genetics to see where did it come from. Is it actually something from there or to... You know, we have a group um, smuggling trade and interdiction. So when we do find things or whatever it came on, then we have trace forward and trace backs, trying to find it to the origin and then working with our different groups to evaluate and, and determine where did that, you know, where did that threat come from? So that's something that I just wanted to add on that. And uh, I was thinking of approaching it not so much from the aspect of bioterrorism, but from intentional introductions through commerce or from uh, personal pets or what have you. And that is something that's being worked on uh, by the State Department of Agriculture, in particular online retailers. So, you know, more and more people are buying things through Amazon or through eBay. And um, first class mail is a uh, protected pathway that um, you can't inspect unless you have probable cause. And so they are working with large vendors uh, like Amazon and eBay to incorporate the regulations that Hawaii has about importation into their shipping policies, which I think is a, a really important step. 
And then the other um, item about people bringing in their personal pets or uh, other materials, a uh, major part of the biosecurity plan is on um, public awareness and in particular uh, airport signage. So for those of you who came in from out of state, um, you know, we don't necessarily have these huge uh, displays or signs saying, you know, why you shouldn't bring uh, certain items in. It's getting better. Uh, the Department of Ag has some new signage up at the Honolulu Airport, um, but we are hoping that there can be a more comprehensive um, re-envisioning of how to use the amnesty bins and let people know on import that when they, um, on entry, when they fill out that form, uh, it's not just a, a meaningless exercise. It's because there's a, an important need to protect Hawaii's agriculture and environments. John, I, I guess I'd just quickly add that, um, you know, when, when the APHIS inspectors went over to the newly created Transportation Security Administration and Customs and Border Protection after 9-11, um, you know, a, a huge focus had to be on, on protecting from terrorist threat. And so those of us who um, we certainly worry greatly about, about our own and, and the world's safety, we sort of felt like we had to take a bit of a back seat um, on the ag and environmental pest, but um, it, it's been a bit of a struggle when uh, resources are short at every level of government and the top priority seems to be reasonably and, and has to be protecting our country from, from terrorist threats. And so how do we, again, you know, I apologize for continuing to hammer on this point, but how do we as state governments and regional associations of governments um, be proactive with um, uh, the federal authorities so that uh, while they have to have this, this priority of protecting the country um, from, you know, terrorist threat um, or somebody wanting to do, you know, harm to, to um, the health and well-being of uh, the people of this country, how can we also, you know, appear a little bit higher on the radar with respect to the agricultural environmental threats? Josh, you had something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to add a short anecdote, and it's not um, particularly about intentional introductions, but uh, I got going about airport signage, and I just wanted to note that um, for anyone who came in from out of state and then had to go through the inter-island terminal uh, in Honolulu, um, I think this is a really good example of needing to work across agencies for education. There are multiple um, displays in the inter-island terminal that um, feature, they're supposed to feature beautiful scenes from Hawaii, and I saw two that um, feature Christmas berry, which is an invasive that we're working on biological control for. Um, one of them is Christmas berry in front of um, a park site on Maui, which you know you can kind of understand. You know, it's a beautiful park on Maui. But I saw another one that is cropped, so it is just Christmas berry, and that's kind of what we're presenting to people, saying, you know, isn't Hawaii great? Um, and so there's some cross-agency uh, work that we need to do there. Right. We're running out of time. Uh, does anybody have one last quick question? Right over here. Hi, this is uh, Mike Melzer, University of Hawaii. This would actually be a follow-up question, I think. With, with the University of Hawaii um, shutting down the select agent program, which would be some of the most likely candidates for intentional introduction, do you, do you envision you know, encouraging somewhere else in the state to, to set up such a program? Could it, can you envision somewhere else that, that such a program could go? Somebody want to take that? Can you say the name of the program again? I didn't hear it. Oh, uh, the Select Agent Program. Um, it's the one that I'm deals sorry, with... I'm sorry, I can't even... The Select what program? S select Agent Select program. Agent. Okay, it's a you. joint USDA-CDC. It, it covers most of the, 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 the worst of the worst, I guess, in terms of pests and pathogens. Anybody want to take that? I'm not even familiar with it, I'm embarrassed to say, but. And I'd have to look into it, I don't, I don't have that information. Unless Dorothy. <laughs> Dorothy, if you're gonna speak, get a microphone. We're to that point in audience participation that tells us we're near the end of a panel. Um, the, uh, USDA and, has... And would you just, for the record, oh, identify yes. yourself, I'm, please? I'm um, Dorothea Allentaga. I'm a state operations coordinator, and I work for <laughs> Vernon. <laughs> um, uh, 
Um, USDA has a select uh, agent program that um, has certain, um, lots of them are diseases that, plant diseases that is, yeah, that can't come um, into the uh, United States and you can't even research them um, without a very high level containment facility. So that's what the select agent, but it's, there's not a, it's not a large list. It's, it's um, um, chosen for really um, kinds of diseases that could spread very easily. Thank you very much. Uh, that wraps up the time we have for the first panel, so 